Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you um, to this Globe Roundtable on the EU and the governance of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have three distinguished speakers today who will each have about five to ten minutes to present uh, their views. Uh, then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. And I would like the audience members to write the questions in the chat. So then I will relay these questions to our speakers. So we have about an hour uh, in this session. So without further ado, let me start by introducing our speakers. First, uh, we have Mr. Christos Stylianidis. Mr. Stylianidis is the former European Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management. Uh, in October 2014, he was appointed by the European Council as uh, EU Ebola coordinator and served until the end of the term of the Juncker Commission in this position as well. He played a key role in the international efforts to contain the Ebola outbreak and the latest outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was one of the first EU officials to visit the affected areas in West Africa at the peak of the outbreak to raise global awareness about Ebola. And also he initiated the regional cooperation that was uh, the key to bring the Ebola outbreak under control. Um, Mr. Stylianides is currently visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics, a faculty member at the University of Nicosia and visiting international professor at Ruhr University Bochum Research School. He's also a special advisor in the European Commission to Vice President uh, Margaritis Schinas on education and emergencies, migration and inclusion. Then uh, we have uh, Professor Sharon Friel. Uh, professor Friel is uh, a professor of health equity and director at the Menzies Center for Health Governance at the School of Regulation and Global Governance, REGNET, at the Australian National University. She was director of REGNET from uh, 2014 until 2019. And Professor Friel is also a fellow at, of the Academy of Social Sciences Australia and a co-director of the NHMRC Center for Research Excellence in Health Equity. She was the head of the Scientific Secretariat of the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health between 2005 and 2008. In 2014, her international peers voted her one of the world's most influential female leaders in global health. Um, Professor Friel's research focuses on the political economy of health, governance and policy related to the social determinants of health inequities, including trade, food systems, urbanization, and climate change. Her 2019 book, Climate Change and the People's Health, highlights the importance of addressing the glo global consumptogenic system, which refers to excess production and consumption that are common drivers of climate change and health inequities. And next, we have Dr. Paul Morillas, who is, a, who is the director of CIDOC here uh, in Barcelona Center for International Affairs. He's a political scientist and holds a PhD in politics, policies, and international relations from Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. And he also holds a master's in international relations from uh, the London School of Economics. He has taught at several universities, including the UAB, Blanquerna, and Esade. He's also a member of the Observatory de Politica Exterior Europa at IBE. Previously, he has been head of the Euro-Mediterranean Policies Field at the European Institute of Mediterranean, coordinator of the Political and Security Committee of the Council of the EU, and advisor on external action at the European Parliament. His uh, numerous published research papers for academic journals and thanks, like his opinion articles, cover global dynamics. European integration, um, European foreign policy, and Euro Mediterranean relations, among others. His latest book is Strategy Making in the EU from Foreign uh, and Security Policy to External a uh, Action, which was published uh, by Palgrave in 2019. And he has recently co directed the documentary Bouncing Back World Politics After the Pandemic, which proposes a reflection on the dynamics and conflict and opportunities for international cooperation in the post-COVID world. Now, I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Stiliadis uh, first. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, first of all, for your invitation, uh, for this very interesting panel discussion. Thanks to the other panelists for uh, this uh, sort of collaboration 
in order to discuss this very demanding and challenging uh, topic, which uh, is really uh, not uh, just interesting, but uh, very, very crucial for all of us in our times. And um, I would like to uh, see and to reply a sort of a question um, about the extent of EU preparedness for a pandemic. And in particular, uh, now uh, when we talk uh, about the COVID-19. Um, first point, we have to admit that the, the current pandemic is really unprecedented. My second point, that in such a magnitude of outbreak, we need a coordinated global response to be more efficient and effective even in each continent, in each country. So nobody can deal alone with such a magnitude just at the national or even just at the continental level. And this is why we need to discuss in depth critical reforms of the WHO. My third point um, is focusing on the European Union inside the challenges and problems. As you know, President of the Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, admitted, and I would like to use her statement here, that during the first stage last spring, spring 2020, we did not manage to offer the necessary solidarity to our member states. At the time, you know very well, Italy and Spain, and you remember, of course, the um, big problem of ventilators in some Italian hospitals in, in North Italy. So we had a lot of weaknesses in the first stage of the pandemic to react with effective solidarity on the ground. My fourth point, fortunately, in the second critical stage concerning the vaccines, as the European Union, we decided to be together by all means. Also, fortunately, we started in June 2020 a real common European response about the purchase of the vaccines. However, the current figures and the, and the comparison between the European Union and the UK, USA, Canada, but particularly with Israel, is really disappointing for us. So we have to start a very sincere and open discussion just after the current really emerging situation to identify the reasons behind this problematic situation. Because the state of play, the roll out of the vaccination has definitely created a lot of mistrust against the European institution and sometimes, unfortunately, against the European project as a whole. So we have to insist on and defend the common European response against any effort from Eurosceptics, Eurosceptics to return to a nationalized response. One of the lessons of this crisis is that national, nationalization does not work. It's an illusion. Also, there are a lot of financial consequences and impact for companies and for individuals, regardless of this really excellent new instrument of the Resilient Recovery Fund. And uh, in this open discussion and dialogue among member states and institutions, um, as former European Commissioner who knows well inside and outside all these uh, 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 institution machines, I think we have to focus on two crucial points. First, 
we have to clarify what we mean by a common European response. And second, how can we overcome the weaknesses of a very heavy machine, machine during a real war emergency period to deal with all aspects of the problem as a real crisis management authority? I think this is the two very crucial questions and points regarding European reaction. And uh, just my first answer, and uh, I can uh, um, repeat something which uh, I said when I, I, I had a very good discussion in Washington with Georgetown University during Ebola crisis regarding our um, comprehensive approach at that time. And an American professor said, stated this, EU states are too integrated to manage the crisis separately and not integrated enough to do so collectively. I think it's a very precise, it's a very uh, accurate statement about the real problem, especially in health emergencies in Europe. But we have to overcome this obvious problem and there is a need to find the division of roles. There is a strong case for building collective EU capacity to respond to major cross-border health challenges through early warning, joint research, and procurement and stock healing of medical supplies. And of course, it requires a warlike mobilization with a speed of decision making and administrative action beyond normal state institutional practice. In any pandemic, we know very well the lack of speed can be left out. So, um, my, my conclusion can focus on this. Three factors explain why most European countries have found it difficult to deal with the, the pandemic. An unsuitable level of integration. Second, an inability to make rapid decision and, of course, a breakdown of trust between governments and the government. Thank you so much for this first intervention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stylianides. Now we would like to uh, hear from Professor Priu. Thank you, thank you, uh, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to join you all. I do have just a few slides, I'm just going to put them up now. Yeah, so I, I, I just want to position my remarks. So I'm here, located here in Australia, uh, and I, I just wanted to reflect on the, the pandemic from, from the location uh, of Australia. I, I don't think I would be uh, informed enough to really comment in any detail as to what has been happening uh, across Europe. Um, but I think there's some general reflections that you'll hear in my remarks uh, from the Australian experience that uh, connect to really what's happening globally, uh, well, in, in high income countries uh, globally. Uh, this, for, for those of you um, who might be interested in what's happening in Australia, so I, I think it would be fair to say that we've had quite a, a significant uh, and positive uh, response uh, in, uh, to do with the, the um, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. 
I've just put some of the figures uh, in terms of the actual cases and the deaths in Australia, and that's the, the current figures uh, there. And what really has been uh, some analysis that was done to try and understand why, if, if we think that this is a, a good public health response, what has happened? And the first thing was a very, very quick formation of a national cabinet within days of us being um, aware of this. There was the formation of a national cabinet. And you may know that in Australia, we have a federated uh, system of government where we have the Commonwealth, six uh, states and two territories. And, you know, usually the politics between the states and territories and the Commonwealth are just, you know, as you would expect in a federated system. Uh, but they all got around the table for the, the National Cabinet and very importantly, were listening to the experts. So the epidemiologists, the virologists, the immunologists, the, the variety of public health experts uh, were feeding in on a daily basis uh, to that National Cabinet. And then one of the other things that we did very quickly uh, was the closure uh, of the international borders uh, and with very strict uh, quarantine. Now that's been incredibly successful because we were seeing most of our cases were coming from overseas. Uh, and you might remember some of the, the big, uh, the, the cruise uh, ships that had landed in Australia and that's what brought uh, many of the cases into the country right at the start. For us, of course, living within the country, it's been impossible to leave uh, and that has posed all sorts of uh, challenges for society more broadly. But then the third uh, part of it has been really uh, quite a, a significant and very quick acceptance uh, across the public of the, the, dis the spatial distancing, uh, the lockdown measures, because uh, that was put in place very quickly uh, as well. And so at the time, the levels of trust in uh, government uh, were were really quite high uh, and trust in the way that government uh, was responding to evidence was really quite high. The fourth was telehealth, but uh, I, I won't say any more about that. So listening to experts, quick response and sharing of uh, lessons was the other important thing that we saw happening. And this, I put this up because this is where we saw in Australia, but of course this is what we see globally, uh, are the types of responses that have been put in place, policy responses that have been put in place as a consequence of COVID-19. And of course down at the bottom has been uh, really the health care and the, now of course all of the discussion around the vaccines. But we did an analysis in the Menzies Centre which looked at these other policy areas because if, if you're concerned about health and you're concerned about the prevention of ill health, then we need to look at the conditions that affect health at this at a population level. And that's issues of income, it's issues of employment, it's issues of education, it's issues of housing, etc. So we looked at what was happening there. And there were, in the Australian context, there were 158 policy measures across those areas that were put in place, not from a health perspective, but have all sorts of positive, potentially positive implications for health. And that was about intersectoral action around that national cabinet table, intersectoral action. So that was very important and very important sharing of lessons uh, between the, at the, sort of the national level and then between the states and territories. And then, of course, we are located in the Asia Pacific region, incredible sharing of lessons between countries in the region as to what was working around the, um, uh, the, the health care, the public health uh, responses. But I would critique all of that and say, if we're concerned about global health and we're concerned about global health governance, then there was nothing addressing some of the underlying root causes and there was nothing that was thinking about social equity. Really what COVID-19 has done is shine a spotlight
on the existence of the pre-existence of social and health inequities and wasn't that such an opportunity to actually do something about it but we haven't seen a focus on that at all and so if we were to really take the opportunity to say well what has COVID shone a light on for us within countries between countries all of the discussion that's been happening around uh, vaccine equity, around vaccine diplomacy, for example, well, that's about issues of trade and intellectual property rights. So in the deliberations around that national cabinet table, it would have been fantastic to have really been starting to think about some of those issues at the time. That would have taken, that would have been a longer term view. We haven't got time to speak about climate change, but there was a missed opportunity, particularly as we're thinking of building back better or building forward better. Um, it could have been a green recovery, but certainly in the Australian context, we haven't seen that. And what we saw also was really using COVID-19 as an opportunity to claw back some positive regulatory advances that had taken place. I'm not sure what has happened across Europe, but in Australia, we were seeing more of a deregulation agenda, a government deregulation agenda in areas of the environment that you know, the environmental movement is just horrified uh, about. And then whilst I've been positive about the national cabinet that was put in place, there was also an opportunity, a completely missed opportunity to think about that differently. So the positive was it happened quickly. There was a sharing of a mechanism for sharing of lessons uh, across the multiple levels of government. And there was the real use of uh, expert evidence, public health expert evidence. But there was nothing uh, from social sciences around that table. And it was, and excuse my um, uh, my language, it was all the usual old white men who were sitting at the table. And so really all those inherent biases that we know get that get built into the governance mechanisms were there front and centre. So what a missed opportunity, really. But so what I would say is if we want to think about global health, and we want to think about reducing global health inequities and the governance of that. Yes, and we'll speak about the vaccine, I'm sure, uh, a lot. But if we want to keep people well and we want to prevent those health inequities, we've got to think governance has to go way beyond the health sector. It should be governance for health, not health governance, I would say. And I would also like to argue that it's time for a social vaccine. Uh, if we're, we absolutely, of course, need the vaccine that uh, we're all um, desperately wanting to get at the moment. But if we're going to address some of those underlying issues that I've been pointing towards, it's about a social vaccine. And myself and I, a colleague wrote about this. Um, and I won't speak through all of that. Um, but just down at the bottom, just to highlight again the importance of just governance, bringing different voices, different interests, not the usual suspects to the table, uh, to think about the delivery, delivery, the inoculation of populations, not just individuals, uh, around some of these underlying conditions that affect people's health and well-being going forward. And I think we've got a very important moment globally, certainly in Australia, certainly uh, across Europe, but globally have this moment. Never before in my life, uh, in my professional life, have I encountered health being right up there with the economy. And so not to miss that opportunity, we can hold them together. It's not an either or. So how do we govern in a way that keeps them together and so of course there's lots of discussions going on uh, around a well-being economy which I would fully support but if we think about the the idea of health at the moment and we know that ideas and discourse and um, frames really matter but I would be very surprised if we were to poll a number of people in this audience how do we think about health well, we're thinking about it in a biomedical way because we're all speaking about the vaccine we're thinking about the disease and i would argue for us going forward we have to not simply be in a biomedical 
idea of health. We, we must embrace, also embrace, a social model of health. And that requires very progressive government. It requires a very progressive governance uh, system to think about a social model of health that's intersectoral. It requires a very progressive governance system to think about equity, um, because that's been absolutely missing. And so I call for a courageous government and a very engaged civil society. And we see that happening already. I've spoken about this as coalitions of hope and webs of influence. We see, I've just put a number of little uh, icons there, but you know, this important moment, this collective consciousness, we see the coalitions happening between the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and uh, health. And I, I won't read through all of that. So I do think the pushing up from civil society to make the argument for being at the table in the building forward better discourse uh, is going to be so important uh, for us to recover across Europe, across Australia, across the region in which I live, uh, across the, the world. If you're interested in reading a little bit more about that, we did, as I mentioned, we did this report. It is very Australian uh, focused, but it just it speaks about those sorts of issues that I've been pointing towards uh, throughout my remarks. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the, the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Creel. Next, we have Dr. Paul Morias from CIDOF. Um, what? Yes, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much for um, for giving me the opportunity to to participate in this roundtable and the framework of your um, globe uh, uh, project, which I've been uh, following closely and and with a great degree of attention because I think it's a very very relevant project also uh, and it's gaining importance even more so than it had uh, as a consequence of the of the pandemic and. and and, uh, and of course, um, in the framework of the good relations that we have with eBay and, and CIDOP, uh, sister organizations, um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And also to, to have Christos Stalianidis uh, with us, because he visited Barcelona in pre-pandemia times and had a, a wonderful talk in our uh, room downstairs, in our conference room downstairs. Um, while he was commissioner, so it's very good that, uh, that we can meet again, even if uh, virtually this time, hopefully next time we'll be in person again. But in any case, I, I will take it where he actually uh, left it when when discussing the the, um, the response of the of the European Union and the lessons learned that we that we should um, underline uh, as a consequence of EU action or or, or not enough action uh, in the in the pandemic and. I will elaborate on, on the quote that he that he mentioned by specifically pointing out uh, the um, the capacity of, of of the European Union to act in this sort of uh, crisis that uh, that are emerging as a consequence of the pandemic. And probably here, what we would say is that the European Union is clearly too integrated not to have acted on this. Um, uh, crisis. So we really expect as a consequence of uh, the high degree of integration in other domains for the EU to also act in this particular domain, in the domain of, of, of health, but again uh, not sufficiently integrated in this particular area, in health, um, to act efficiently. And this is uh, not only the, the problem that the EU has been confronted to in this crisis, but in many other crises. And when I speak about the European Union, I mostly refer to Brussels and not so much on uh, the capacity of the member states to act on different, on different crises. This is a recurrent um, uh, trend in the last few years of, of crisis, perhaps, with the only exception of what has been the uh, negotiations over Brexit, and I will refer to that in a, in a, in a minute. So if we take this health um, crisis as a, as a departing point and we, and we picture the necessity of EU action together with the expectations 
that European citizens, but also governments and multiple um, uh, governance structures within the EU have, then we can see this gap clearly reflected. Uh, reflected. We uh, have too much. Uh, we have too much integration, or we expect a lot from EU integration as we have it today. But not. Uh, we haven't decided to integrate uh, enough for us to act efficiently. And I think. I think it's, this is a crucial idea to understand the role of the European Union. Why? Because if we. And this is my second point. If we turn into the. Um, alternative scenario it's always good to 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 picture ourselves in what would have happened if things had been differently i am sure that at this point if the eu hadn't taken a leading role in, and by the eu i mean the commission again hadn't taken a, 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 a very important role in negotiating the purchase of the vaccines the rollout of the vaccines and so on we would certainly be speaking about um, eu disintegration today. We would be witnessing a situation whereby member states would be fighting uh, one against the other for the supply of uh, good that is, as of today, very scarce or not, uh, 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 not plenty enough. Um, we would be witnessing probably big member states, France, Germany, or powerful member states in terms of um, uh, their wealth, such as the Netherlands, securing vaccines for uh, their own populations first, while we would be uh, necessarily looking at Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, or even Spain lagging behind in the, um, in the, in the vaccination rollout. Today, the fact that we are lagging behind uh, the UK or the US has to do with the supply of vaccines not so much with the um, um, uh, irregularities or the, or the inequality of supply among the member states. And that is a, quite an important thing to understand because, um, because if we were having this conflict over supply of vaccines among member states, that would be a uh, very good starting line for all those who have predicted the failure of the European Union to confront current challenges. And this is not what we are seeing. Of course, if this situation was happening uh, with full availability of vaccines, then we would be uh, talking about something different. But we have to be sure that at the short term uh, where we are in terms of the EU's capacity to, 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 to procure uh, vaccines, we are certainly confronted to a situation whereby um, we do not have enough of, of, of vaccines. One can point out the mistakes that were, um, that were uh, and this is the third point that I wanted to make, the mistakes that were um, happening during the process of negotiations with the big pharma companies and for the supply of the, of, of the vaccines. One can certainly um, uh, refer to a problem of managing the capabilities that the European Commission had uh, when embarking on this, uh, on this, um, on this task. Uh, too much emphasis put on price and not enough on supply, uh, too much centrality in the hands of a small reduced group of, um, uh, of staff around the president of the European Commission, too much overseeing the whole process. But these are procedural problems that are, of course, uh, affecting the, the capacity of the Commission to, um, to be a, a credible and effective actor, but they do not question the overall political choice that let's remind, remind ourselves was made by the commission but also by member states who decided that the joint uh, efforts in, in procuring the vaccine would be delegated to the european commission and why is it so important this uh, this choice because if member states wanted to preserve something that is very much at the core of the european union which is freedom of movement um, of goods, capitals, people, and services, at some point when the vaccine was brought under control, this required that the vaccination program was also understood in a European framework. So there was a clear link in the decision-making procedure on how to act on, 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 uh, on the role of, 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 the, of the vaccines and the, and the supply of the vaccines that linked 
the single market, the freedoms associated to the single market, together with the supply of the, of the vaccines. Because otherwise, if uh, we wanted to secure the freedom of movement within the EU, but member states were at very different speeds when it came to the procurement of vaccines, then uh, that would certainly have meant that the uh, freedom of movement could not be secured once uh, the, uh, the vaccine was available. And this was the political choice that was made in the hands of the European Union at the beginning. If we want to look beyond the current crisis and secure um, what, has, what have been the advancements of the European Union in uh, freedom of movement, we also have to act jointly in, um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the vaccine uh, programs. Of course, um, this was a new endeavor for the, for the European Commission. We've learned so much that those countries that have been successful have, have been those that had previous experience in managing uh, this sort of, uh, of, of, of pandemics in terms of early warning mechanisms, in the control of the outbreaks, in the restrictions, uh, also Sharon right, uh, right now also presented the Australian case, in the tracing mechanisms and so on. So we knew that a very crucial aspect for being successful in the endeavor was having had previous experiences. Well, here is where the European Union didn't have enough experience and does enough capabilities to, to, to be successful from the, uh, from the beginning in the first place. But the political choice, I continue to argue, that was the right one. And final point here on, um, on what I mentioned with regards to the comparison with Brexit and coronavirus and the response to it. We've learned that joint action uh, um, is better than bilateral negotiations. The, U the UK also tried to divide and rule the European Union when approaching the negotiations uh, on the future status of, uh, um, after Brexit. Um, member states came to the conclusion that if, we, if they entered in this bilateral game, uh, the final result would be negative. So in a sense, this is a clear example of a win-win um, uh, process and, and the way why uh, joint action also is better in the long term than bilateral action and negotiations. And this will certainly, once the supply is secured, once the vaccines are available and so on, when we look back, we will probably see that this was also the right choice to be made. In the meantime, we are uh, suffering from the short-term hiccups of the process. And this is also exactly what happened during the Brexit negotiations. We knew that the approach was the correct one, but in between, we fought over Northern Ireland, the protocols, we fought over uh, the status of, uh, uh, of, of people in the uh, Europeans residing in the UK while the negotiations were unfolding. We discussed on many issues that made us look at the short term of the negotiations as a failure. But if we looked at the beyond uh, what uh, these negotiations were, um, what was happening during this negotiation, and we look at the current status quo, we see that the result of the negotiations very much resembles what the European Union was putting forward right from the beginning. You want to exit the single market, you want to exit um, the regulations of the single market because you want to uh, regain sovereignty, as the UK used to say, well then uh, the following rules apply. And this, if we look at the agreement that has been reached in, uh, uh, on Brexit, is quite actually what was predicted in the famous um, um, ladder of possibilities that Barnier used to put forward when presenting the options that were available for securing the agreement between the EU and the UK. So uh, again, some similarities, despite, as I was saying, the short term uh, hiccups. The problem, and I will finish with this, is that during this process, we get too much engaged in the short term appraisal of the process, and we tend to thus overemphasize the institutional uh, problems that are there uh, uh, in the European Union, the, um, the, the problems of governance that appear in such crises, and we do not focus on the big picture of, uh, of, of these crises, which basically are asking once and again for a redesign of the current institutional framework within the European Union. And the power that Brussels has over certain things, the capacity of member states or the willingness of member states to give 
additional powers to the supranational institutions, the willingness of citizens for the EU to play a stronger role in things that affect their daily lives, the expectations thus that citizens have on the EU's capacity to act and the limitations that the current structures and institutions put forward. These big picture uh, elements are often missed um, when, when reflecting on the, on the subsequent crisis. This was clearly the case during the Euro crisis, was the case during the refugee crisis, it was the case during Brexit, and it is being the case during the coronavirus crisis. So we are basically going from one crisis to the other, successfully, in a sense, managing the crisis, or at least not um, uh, going all the way to the demise of the European Union that the Krugmans and the likes want to always put forward as a possibility. The European Union is doomed to fail. It will not survive this crisis and so on. This hasn't happened, but at the same time, we haven't reformed enough. We haven't given enough thoughts to the need for, uh, for reform and most importantly, to the political will that is necessary to undertake such reforms. And this is where the European Union always reaches a suboptimal level of uh, integration and, 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 and efficiency when, when coping and dealing with the crisis. Sorry if I was a bit too long uh, in these uh, preliminary remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to thank each and every um, uh, participant for these very insightful comments. And right now we would like to open the um, floor to questions from the audience. Um, and as you're um, thinking and typing, um, I would like to maybe relay a, a few questions to the speakers myself. So um, let's begin maybe with uh, Mr. Stylianidis. You were also the former EU Ebola coordinator. What lessons do you think that the EU has learned from this management of the outbreak? And which lessons were, in your opinion, were successfully or unsuccessfully applied uh, in the, the case of the, um, in the face of COVID-19 in, in Europe. So that would be very, I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. And uh, Professor Phil, um, I would be very interested to hear a little bit more about um, the root causes that you have identified in your presentation. Uh, you said there's very little attention to the, the root causes behind the, uh, the, these repeated instances of, of pandemic events. Um, so what are some of these root causes that you're referring to? Are they related in any way to this consumptogenic factors that you have earlier identified in your research? And um, to, to uh, Dr. Morillas, so you basically suggest that um, the, the political decision um, for joint procurement is um, a successful one in the context of the EU. This, this is, I think, the point that you're making. So um, this, this is all fine and good, but I'm also wondering, a lot of people are, they seem to be quite unhappy because of the shortage of, of vaccines, right? If you talk to anyone, they're like, I don't know when I'm getting it. I don't know if that I will ever get it. And especially among the elderly, there seems to be also a growing and I, I'm worried about this a little bit, about this lack of trust in the EU institutions. What are some of the medium to long term consequences, even though the decision was right with respect to, you know, keeping the union together and acting together to, to you know, avoid these <clears throat> problems with bilateral negotiations? But I mean, what about the citizen trust in the EU institutions? What, what, what kind of implications can we observe there? So, um, but let's maybe hear uh, a first round of remarks and I will um, look at the questions from the audience. And Professor Freed, would you like to respond first? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kick off. Uh, maybe if my questions is getting together. Um, yeah, so those, those, those sort of root causes of human health and well-being, and I, yeah, I will speak maybe a little bit more about that consumptogenic system. So if you think of the, dri the common drivers of poor health and environmental degradation, it's the whole system of basically consumption, production and consumption, you know, the system of policies, of industry practices, of uh, social and institutional norms that absolutely incentivize and reward fossil fuel heavy uh, behaviors, products, ways of being. 
And so an argument might be that if we want to do something about climate change and we want to do something about keeping people well and, and, and all of, I should say, all of that is, of course, incredibly unequally distributed between and within countries. And so I mean, what an incredible opportunity to do something that you address those common drivers of these outcomes of environmental degradation, inequality and human health and well-being. But of course, that goes to some of the um, the points that Paul was really speaking about there in terms of institutional power, of vested interests. Um, and so that requires real attention to uh, the structures uh, that you, that are driving these issues. That's the root causes of, of health. And if we don't pay attention to that intersection between the human and the natural systems, the coupling between these human and natural systems, we will see more epidemics, uh, we will see more pandemics in the way uh, that we're seeing with COVID-19. You know, we, we see species uh, jumping, we see as uh, the loss of natural habitats, species moving into uh, locations where they wouldn't otherwise uh, have been. And that, that will uh, be a problem uh, for us for some of the pandemics going forward. So COVID-19 isn't the last that we're going to see of anything like this unless we address some of those underlying uh, policy, institutional, industry uh, and uh, population uh, sort of behaviours and, and norms. And taking that long term view, some of that institutional reform uh, that Paul was speaking about, some of that long term view um, has to build that into it. Thank you. Um, would, would the uh, Mr. Stylianides, would you like to respond? Yes. First of all, I I would like to say that uh, we had the excellent uh, presentation, both from uh, Sharon and Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much for this really very interesting presentation. And um, maybe we need uh, more time in order to discuss even the global health challenges, also the European challenges. We, we just touch in the, in, the, in the first stage of this very comprehensive issue, but maybe uh, it's good to, to make another uh, panel discussion in Barcelona. And I will, <laughs> I will come in order to, to meet my good friend uh, at the seaboard uh, uh, think tank. So, as uh, EU is as a former EU Ebola coordinator, what uh, lessons learned and applied to the current pandemic? First of all, we have to say that it is difficult to make a comparison and see real similarities with a really different magnitude of outbreak. This is my first point. Here we talk about a real pandemic and with an international impact which concerns the whole world. In Ebola outbreak, in, uh, especially in West Africa, in uh, 2014 until 2016, it was uh, a, a sort of regional epidemic, a regional outbreak. And now the virus is really more contagious than Ebola, easier to, to transmit. Of course, during the Ebola outbreak, the mortality was more than 60%, especially during the uh, epidemic in West Africa, before vaccine, before uh, uh, medicine. And at that time, the major problem was the real collapse of the national health systems even before the outbreak had become public, had become obvious, had become visible. At the time, with a lot of difficulties on the ground and many heroes of the local humanitarians and uh, other NGO members, we managed to isolate and to defeat the virus in the three affected countries of West Africa you remember Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, but definitely 
we can learn a lot from that experience and this is why um, we we made some uh, improvements and some innovative actions inside the European institutions. Just three points. First, um, I strongly believe, and this is why I already said in my first intervention, we have to continue the reforms of the WHO. And I would like to uh, completely agree with Sharon about this idea, social vaccine and social medicine. And this um, is something which we have uh, to deliver definitely with an upgrade of the WHO uh, responsibilities and authorities. And this is maybe we need to see a sort of new agreement. It will be similar with the climate change agreement in Paris regarding health emergencies. So I completely agree with Sarah about this, but of course, you, you know that we need a lot of pressure on many international actors in order to see this initiative be in place. And uh, I remember I was in Paris and I know very well that uh, we need a, a, a real leadership at the international level in order to see the new um, state of play, state of affairs inside the WHO. So we need reforms at the WHO level. Because um, this global mechanism is something to the only way to mobilize collective instruments during pandemic in order to facilitate fairer distribution of vaccines and medicines because it is a big challenge and we have to face it collectively, only collectively. My second point. At that time, we set up the European Medical Corps in 2016 and uh, more or less was the EU main response to the Ebola outbreak and to the main challenge of undercapacity during the, the epidemic. EMC remains a part of EU's comprehensive approach to disaster and emergency. It's now part of uh, so-called rescue, the new name of the European civil protection mechanism, more or less. And uh, this allows for mobilization of a range of medical capacities. Medical teams, medevac, med medical evacuation, uh, medical lamps, and so on. So I think it's a, it's a good starting point about our um, new rethink at the level of WHO, but also at the level of the European Union, even at the national level in Australia, in the USA, in the UK, and so on. Um, my third point is about RESCEU. Um, RESCEU is more or less my baby. <laughs> uh, as a European Commission, I propose uh, RESCEU, and as, a, as our new instrument, especially focus on forest fires and other emergencies. At that time, in our uh, debates with, in the European Parliament, but in other institutions, uh, I propose that rescue can expand um, so that it can cover health emergencies and other disasters and accidents. At that time, it was difficult to find the uh, um, um, a common agreement among member states. I think after COVID-19 pandemic, it's a critical time, a time to discuss if this expansion, and if this expansion is not possible, maybe we have to talk about a new medical agency, new instrument, which will focus only on health emergencies inside and outside the world. I think through this new medical agency, maybe we will overcome some bureaucratic obstacles, 
and I think uh, Paul um, already described it in a very uh, uh, good description. And um, in some times, um, when we talk about risk management and crisis management, we need less bureaucracy, we need more decision-making approach, and of course, um, innovation in a risk management. So we need a real coordination, and maybe we have to talk about the coordination during um, this pandemic, because at that time, my role as EU coordinator for the whole Europe, it was something which really very effective and efficient, especially at the level of the decision making at a very uh, fast way and a very critical way on the ground and at a critical point. So my uh, new proposal, maybe we have to see how we are going to, the, to a new instrument, new medical agency focus on health emergencies. And also, we need to start this debate worldwide regarding the critical reform of the WHO. Thank you so much again. And um, unfortunately, I have to leave because I have a um, next uh, engagement, next obligation. And um, it was a really amazing uh, uh, input for me with this excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stylianides. Um, now let's hear from Dr. Moria. Yes, thank you. And I will be I will be short because um, I think that the, the the question that comment that was raised at, uh, at the chat by uh, Georgios and that Euphoria you also uh, put forward is uh, is a crucial one, which is basically uh, the consequences for um, our understanding of uh, the citizens' understanding of the usefulness of the European Union, of the legitimacy of the European Union, and, and, and the effectiveness uh, when dealing with such crises. And I think that this is part of what I was calling the big picture um, issues that we always left aside when, when being confronted to, to crises such as, such as this one, but that will eventually be the most important ones if, you, if, if we take the, the, a broader look at, at what has or has not been done. I, I would rather say, rather than successful, um, the European Union in managing the, the crisis, or at least in the in the vaccine procurement, I would say that it was necessary that it was done this way, which doesn't mean that it was done in the best possible way. Not at all. It, there were a lot of, as I said, short term uh, in, and by short term, I mean current uh, hiccups in the process that actually affect this um, this malaise uh, uh, the, uh, among among Europeans all over, uh, particularly when compared to the UK, when compared to the US, um, whereby uh, we are lagging behind. And of course, this necessarily has an impact on the credibility and the legitimacy of the European Union to act in such situations. Uh, my point was, first, it was necessary to, to do this way, uh, possibly. The alternative was worse. And my third point was, we were not prepared enough as Europeans or the governance system on, of the European Union on health issues was not and is not yet powerful enough to cope with such situations. In another case, in, in, in where the responsibilities were much more clear, uh, clear cut in terms of uh, whose responsibility it is, um, we would also be blaming the politicians for, uh, for problems that, have, that would have happened. And we would probably ask for their, um, um, for their leaving office and, 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 and resigning their duties, something that we are not able to do to a, uh, to a such clear extent at the, at the European Union. But again, this speaks about the governance problem of the European Union. Who is responsible for those decisions that we decide that are better taken at the European level um, and that no one really uh, is able to, uh, to respond to the public uh, um, if things go wrong? 
these are all democracy, very deep-rooted democracy, legitimacy-related problems. And certainly this is something that it goes way beyond what we can discuss here, but that is, that is, um, that is quite important. Um, I would not um, go in line with saying um, uh, everything had to be this way and the EU was the only way to do it. I would rather say if we want the EU to play a stronger role in this domain, then, then let's make sure that we give the capabilities, we give the instruments, we have the powers, we have the competences to deal with these situations in the future. For the time being, in this, at this moment, um, we were not in a very uh, clearly structured uh, uh, way of acting. And the European Commission had a lot of shortages uh, to successfully uh, undertake this, um, this, uh, this initiative. Some progress is being made on the discussion of, over a European BARDA, so an agency, a biomedical research agency um, that is uh, present in the US, but it, we don't have it here in the, in the EU. So there are certain steps to be done for future crises, but in the meantime, of course, we are disappointed with the current state of play on how the EU is, uh, is, is acting on, on this crisis. On, in terms of European integration, let's hope that this helps for uh, better, uh, better responses in the future. In the meantime, of course, we cannot be very, very positive on the way things are unfolding, particularly if we look on a short-term basis and not so much in a long-term, which, which I mentioned it, uh, in, in the beginning. But uh, I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. but. Um, the, the, some of the questions from the audience have been answered, I guess. There's one question for Professor Friel about uh, this, um, um, the role of the biomedical uh, model um, and how it has evolved historically, which he has answered briefly over here. But maybe just before we close and end our, our session, um, maybe Professor Friel, you can elaborate a little bit about the distinction between this well-being model and the, the biomedical uh, model that you refer to in your presentation and how it might actually apply to future, uh, addressing future pandemics. Yeah, so really the uh, biomedical model uh, treats things as a disease, uh, as uh, often at an individual level and thinking about, you know, it's a very treatment focused uh, way of thinking about health but as a, a social model really understands that there are things about society that contribute to health and well-being and it's not an either or we need both the biomedical because you think of all of the the, the vaccine uh, would not have been uh, developed without uh, a biomedical focus so it's vital that we have a biomedical understanding of health as well as a social model um, but my argument and many others in the health the world of health equity would say if we only focus on a biomedical focus uh, then we miss the fact that there are many more contributing factors uh, to keeping people well I mean if you think a vaccine we get a vaccine when we're sick we go to our uh, GP or we go to our doctor when we are sick but what is it that keeps us well what keeps us well mentally what keeps us well physically uh, it's our, all these other social factors socio-cultural socio-economic you know, a whole variety of factors so we need both we absolutely need both uh, and I think the opportunities that the other speakers have been speaking about in the thinking of that governance system across Europe, wouldn't it be fantastic if we had both the biomedical and the social built together rather, and I, I would be horrified if you had a separate medical uh, institution um, because that just keeps separating these things. Um, so please, please don't do that in Europe. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think this is really a historical moment to take these um, proposals into uh, consideration when you know, ongoing, when initiating these institutional reforms and the new agency that was also proposed by Mr. Stylianidis. But I would like to thank you for your time and for your participation. This has been a, a great um, event. And um, uh, for the uh, members of the audience, please uh, follow us our links uh, for future events on the globe. 
Uh, and um, I guess uh, we will be seeing you in uh, future gatherings. Thank you so much.